Imagine being able to identify if a business will not only survive, but thrive before you buy it. Hey, this is Jared Krause, host of the Buying Online Businesses podcast. And in this episode, I'm talking with John Mees, who is the CEO of Cowork Inc. and the co-founder of Notable. And in this podcast episode, John and I specifically talk about why businesses fail and how to identify some of those things in these businesses before you even buy them. We talk about why the information age is actually over and the insight age is beginning and what that means for you and how you can actually benefit from the shift. We also talk about how critical it is to put people first and results first in your business to allow it to grow. And then we dissect five different growth strategies of a business and why you should only pick one of those growth strategies and find out which one that should be in this podcast episode. And then lastly, we talk about why having a more enjoyable business is a great way to set the business up to thrive. Now, guys, this is such an invaluable episode. You're absolutely going to love it. Before we get stuck into the podcast episode, I want to tell you that this podcast is not the only way I can help you for free. I have my due diligence framework 2.0, which a lot of people in, in, in the industry have been raving about, which will help you with knowing what to look out for when buying a website, including questions to ask the seller and everything you need to set yourself up to buy a business with less risk. So to get that, go to buyingonlinebusinesses.com forward slash free resources. And there's some other cool free resources on that page too. Let's get stuck into the episode. Today's episode is brought to us by Niche Website Builders, which is a company a few of my clients are using and have used for content creation and link building services. They do everything from start to finish. So from keyword research all the way to uploading your completed article for you. We've also had Bob members buy ready-made affiliate sites built by Niche Website Builders. So if you're looking to outrank your competitors' content and build better backlinks, Niche Website Builders and I have a special deal for you. Head to nichewebsite.builders forward slash Bob. I'll put a link in the show notes for you. But again, that's www.nichewebsite.builders dot builders forward slash Bob. Do you want to start investing in websites, but don't want to drop $20,000 or more on your first investment? Check out Odie's where you can buy premium aged domains to build a website on and add done for you affiliate site packages to help you grow your website and get seen. Instead of buying a crummy website that's been built to sell with no authority, buy a premium aged domain with built-in authority great SEO and fresh quality content for your website. Odie's right now has a crazy 30% off summer sale on until the end of August. So head to odys.global to check out their great deals. That's O-D-Y-S dot G-L-O-B-A-L. Link will be in the description too. Hey, John, thanks so much for coming on the Buying Online Businesses podcast. What a time to talk about a business in terms of what it needs to survive through this sort of stage that we're going through, this this huge like shift. And it's not just like locally, it's internationally, Mm -hmm. specifically for an online business. It's a wild time. And before we even hit the record button, we talked about like the ramifications that can come, not just people, I mean, a lot of people are, you know, tend to lean towards short-sightedness in, and I'm thinking 10 years ahead, even longer. And you said mm-hmm. the same as well in, in, in what can happen and what we need to do to be able uh, to be prepared for, or at least get back up and running if, if our business is having trouble. So I'm really excited to dig into that. Now, first and foremost, why do, this is a pretty broad question, but what are some of the things that we should identify in a business that could possibly cause it to fail. Now, a lot of people here are wanting to buy an online business Mm -hmm. and they say, you don't want to, you know, don't want to make it a bad investment and buy something that can just start decaying as soon as you take it over. So what are some of the like top things that you see that really cause a business to, to struggle? Well, I would say, I mean, I would say the first thing, Okay, we could get into sales and marketing and finance, right? Because the flow of money is probably the most important technical yeah. aspect of what's going on in business, right? From sales to marketing, or from marketing to sales to finance. But mm. if we actually go deeper than that, I think the most important question with a business is, is they creating a real solution to a real problem for real people? 
And that's awesome. that's true no matter what technology we're talking about. That's true whether mm. we're talking about online businesses or offline businesses, whether we're talking stone age or information age or the next age. And that's something that honestly a lot of companies get wrong, unfortunately. They're focused on the PL or the the sales, number of followers. And those are important, but those are real people. And so I think a famous yeah. example of this, are you familiar with the story of Juicero by any chance? No, do you know tell about this? It. Yeah. Okay. So Juicero was this company that raised, I just looked it up, they, just raised, they raised $118 million from, you know, big v, from B, big venture capital companies. I mean, Google Ventures and many well-known investors invested in them in 2013. And they were launching this new machine that was gonna be in every house. The Juicero machine is $400. It sits on your counter and it creates a beautiful cup of fresh green juice in the morning for you to drink. How does it do it? Well, you put a produce pack in there. You buy produce packs from Juicero and you put it in the Juicero machine and the produce pack is kind of like a squeeze pouch. And the Juicero machine okay. squeezes the pouch out with a little water into a cup and gives you breakfast. And these machines are $400 a piece. Well, <laughs> unfortunately for them, Bloomberg published an article showing how you could actually just like take the juice packets and like squeeze them by hand without the $400 machine and it also worked. <laughs> and, and not have and to buy them from what, Juicero. And, <laughs> <laughs> no, you did, and so it was all of a sudden it was like, wait a second. Yeah. This is not creating a real solution to a real problem for real people. And sure enough, the company went, no longer exists. They close. And there are many stories like this of businesses that where investors come in and they go, ooh, that looks exciting. I'm going to put, you know, that mm. they see a really cool slide of like the market potential and they invest in a business thinking like this is going to be great. And then it doesn't. And almost always you can trace it back to where they clear on who the real people they were serving, what the real problem was they were solving and what their real solution was. And those three things are, they seem simple, but you've probably seen this, Jared. It's not, I mean, it's not, it's not simple, right? So many people gloss over it's, this. Yeah. Well, it's basically talking about like product, finding product market fit, right? Where we've got to yes, go yes. find that, all right, how do we get this service or this product that people are actually going to mm -hmm. love to a point that we get great feedback in terms of a case study, a testimonial or even if you're just a media, the media business, like great comments and feedback on your media. That's really what we're looking for is like, is, is a business has great product market fit, right? Yes. I, yes. And I think the reality is the reason why I say real people, real problem, real solution is because it's really easy actually to hear product market fit or to hear revenue yes. or number of sales yes. and to forget that there are real human beings we're talking about, right? It's not like imaginary monopoly pieces we're moving around. And so that's why I say real people, real problem, real solution is because you have to actually think, can you name one customer who and how this, pro this product has solved a problem in their life? Now, here's the good news. If you're looking to buy an online business and they've got that sort of figured out and you can clarify that, that can actually be one of the best ways to get immediate return on your investment is all of a sudden you come to a business that's already doing pretty well and you clarify in their marketing and in their team communication, their customer service, who are our real people we're serving? What is the real yeah. problem we're solving? And what is our real solution? That's also, by the way, how Steve Jobs turned Apple around when he first came back. I mean, after he was kind of forced out of the company and then came back to Apple, is he 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 looked at their list of products and he said, no, we do we do these four products and that's it. And he got rid of almost all their products, all the really fancy state-of-the-art stuff because it was confusing people. And he wanted mm. to clarify for people, no, here's the solution we offer. And then that's when they really blew up as a company. Yeah, and that's a huge thing for, for staff and employees <laughs> is to actually Make it not just like have them less, have the whole process and the SOPs and everything less complicated, but more simple, but essentially to have them see the results, see how happy the people are that are using the product and service, which allows that mm -hmm. team to buy into how awesome we are as a company or a business, right? So that end result is like- yes is I think sometimes people get into business because they, well, especially in the people listening in this, want to get into business because they want to make money to get out of the rat race or to get out of like survival phase and definitely chase the money. And that's a, that can be a short-term, short-term vision, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I view money really profit in a business. I view that as a scorecard for how well you've served humanity. And so, yes, please make a lot of profit. 
but do it by serving real people. And that's what's actually gonna serve you long-term. And this is why that we're talking about the whole book, my book is focused on how to build a profitable business in any economy, including mm -hmm. this one, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that promise is very intentional because this is not focused on, okay, what works in a really good economy, what works in a does not really great economy? No, the question is, even in a bad economy, the question is, okay, do people have problems? Do they have more problems now or less problems now? <laughs> and once you realize, well, actually they have more problems now. Okay, well, what solutions can you provide? Because that's what business is all about. So I think also when you get clear on that real people, everything else becomes easier because we could talk about customer demographics, target customers, email marketing funnels and all of that. Mm -hmm. But when you get clear on a real human being that your business is serving, then you need you activate your empathy advantage as a human being to say, can you walk through the selling story of how this real person interacts with your business? How do they go in marketing speak from prospect to lead to customer? But in human speak, right? How do they first hear about you? What's the first time decision that you give them a chance to say yes to doing business with you in some way? You know, how does that turn into greater and greater financial commitment and greater and greater transformation? And how do you really embed your business in their life so they're making repeat decisions I repeat purchases month after month after month. So you're getting more sales from more customers more often. That's what business is, growth is really all about, but it all stems from that decision on who your real people are. Yeah, spot on. Like, I just want to highlight something that some people listening may be thinking and going, but Jared, I own a, like a, a content business, a media business where I produce articles and we have ad, ad revenue and, and affiliate revenue. I think people, if they may be thinking about all right, this is not going to work for my type of business when this is when we you you guys are mostly talking about product businesses but in reality is that if you think about what you're saying with your content business or your media business you shouldn't think about how much traffic can i get to the site to how how much money can i make think about though that's not traffic that's a human being and they're having an experience mm -hmm. on your on your actual site and you're helping them with their actual problem with the quality of content that you have if you have good quality content now you can have less people come to your website but more quality i would would say more relevant with more relevant problems wanting to solve them and if you solve mm -hmm. them you're going to make more money from your business than just pushing a whole bunch of traffic to your site just because you need more traffic to make more money it's it's kind of backwards isn't it yes exactly and and that's why, by the way, when I talk about business being creating a real solution to a real problem for real people, mm -hmm. is solution is admittedly a broad term, right? Because that solution might be your content, right? Your yeah. Yeah. article or your video or your podcast is a solution for somebody, mm -hmm. right? To their problem. Mm -hmm. But it's not content for content's sake, right? I mean, we don't need another 5,000 words on the internet, right? Nobody needs that. <laughs> Nobody's asking, nobody's thinking, man, I really wish someone would publish another 2,000 word article today. No, they're yeah. thinking, man, <laughs> they're thinking, you know what? I just, I thought it'd be cool to start a small goat farm in my backyard. And now my goat mm. is really sick. And I just found out it has an iron deficiency. And I'm trying to figure out what do I do if I have a goat that has an iron deficiency? By the way, that is one of the most highest selling courses on Teachable online courses is wow. how to treat your goat who has an iron deficiency, right? Because it's a real <laughs> problem that real people have. That's not an imaginary example. <laughs> It's so cool. Yeah. It's, 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 I'm so glad that you said, oh, I just need to, people need another 2000 word article because that's what most people are optimizing their businesses for is like, all right, I'm just mm -hmm. going to outsource this content to someone who doesn't know anything about goats and they're going to write a 2000 words with some keywords in it. And it's not really solving a real problem, is it? <laughs> it's like, no. Yeah. Yeah. So what's enjoyable about a business is like seeing people get results, seeing people get value out of the product and the services and the media that you bring, right? Is that a big aspect of a surviving business is having it be enjoyable for the owner and the team? Yes. And that's actually why my book is called Survive and Thrive. So okay. the survive parts are prerequisite, right? You got to do that. Mm -hmm. You got to stay in business. Mm -hmm. You got to stay open. You got to keep operations going. But that's not the goal, right? Your goal is not to just survive for five years mm -hmm. or 10 years or 50 years or whatever, right? You want to thrive. And I love the word thrive because it captures 
this aspect from nature where you have a thriving organism, right? Like a plant that's luscious and green. Maybe it's got flowers or fruit growing off of it. It's not in the middle of a desert either. It's in a lush environment surrounded by other thriving plants, right? Well, I want your business to be that way. I mean, that's the whole point here is to say, look, you need to survive. Do that first. Check those boxes. Here's how to make sure your business is going to do well. And then you immediately need to get focused on how do you build a thriving business that fuels your life rather than mm. the other way around. Now, this is something that I think will actually, by the way, Jared, be especially useful to people listening to this podcast is that if you're buying a business, well, of course, you want it to be in a healthy enough place to invest in it, right? But it actually works in your favor if there are some major holes in the business, right? Because then you plug those holes and right away you can see a return on your, on your investment. And so that's actually something that normally when I'm working with entrepreneurs who are building one from scratch, then I help them go through an assessment that figures out kind of what's missing in their business to build that out. Mm. Well, mm. I mean, I didn't, this was not why I created that tool, but that actually could be a really valuable way for your audience to be able to assess a potential business or a newly acquired business to immediately yeah see an opportunity for growth and transformation. So, I mean, that's thriving is, is, is the goal. Yeah. Oh, of course. Nobody wants to just, I'm just going to get into business to cross my fingers and toes and hopefully I make it through the survival phase. Like that's, that sounds yeah. like no fun at all. That's not going to be very enjoyable, which is what we're talking about. And this is what I do in my community. We have a community people join and I teach them to buy run and grow businesses. And so when they go to the buy phase, we do a due diligence review and I kind of look at the business and make sure, you know, where are the risks? How can we remove those? Which mm -hmm. in, a, in a sense, when you remove a risk, that's a growth opportunity as well. And we also look at what's yes. missing in the business that can allow it to thrive and, and just grow. But I wanted to ask you, because I mean, you can have a business that is getting people results and you can enjoy the mm -hmm. business, but it can still fail, right? So mm -hmm. what are some of the, like, because we've talked pretty broad up until now sure, about sure. like a, bit, a few things, but what are some of the like the nitty gritty things within a business that even if it is enjoyable, even if it is getting people results, what are some of the other things that can allow it to fail? Well, I think one of the easiest is just, you know, just, just distraction and watering down your efforts. And so, I mean, the reality is in the world we live in today, there's no shortage of opportunity, but there is a shortage of focused execution, right? I mean, you've got people who are like, they're growing their business, they're doing SEO, they're doing Google ads, they're on Facebook, they're on LinkedIn, they're on Twitter, they're on TikTok, and they're sort of getting a little bit of traction in each place, right? I see you nodding your head. Does it sound familiar, Jared? Uh, um, this is exactly what we talk about in, in my mastermind. It's, <laughs> it's great. Keep going. I love it. Oh, good. Good, good. So the reality is that all of those are different ways you can grow your business, but you can't do everything. You can do anything, but you can't do everything. And so then what I teach is that, you know, one of the things is that you got to get clear on your growth model, right? And this concept, I got to give credit where credit is due. This originally comes from Eric Ries, who wrote the book, The Lean Startup. And he talks about how there's this growth hypothesis you make, right? You assume that your business is going to grow, right? I mean, that's, that's an assumption, but how? And in his book, he outlines three growth models. And then I added a fifth to really kind of try to flesh that out a little bit in terms of what I think are really the five growth models to growing a business today. And so, you know, the first of those is, and this is, I mean, before I listed these five, the goal here is to pick one, right? You don't need to do all yes. five. Pick one. Yes. <laughs> like you got, yeah, we got to, I got to emphasize that over and over again, right? Just pick one. You, I know some people are thinking, oh, great. There's five new ways you can grow my business. No, no, no. <laughs> you only need one. <laughs> because right? let's let's give that let's give that some context because if you do pick five Please. you're going to be that person that's going all right i'm going to try to do facebook instagram linkedin youtube and twitter and you're not going to get much you might get a little bit of results from all five not much but if you were to choose mm -hmm. one and you went all in on that you'd be able to get far more results than you would between the spread between the five with less work. So it's really essentially about yes. being smarter, working smarter, not harder, yes. working less, but earning more. Yes, I love strategy. that. I'm glad you brought that up. That's one of my core values, core principles is work smarter, not harder. So the five growth models, the first one is viral, also known as word of mouth marketing. The reality is all the platforms we just mentioned are all kind of like they're channels of viral marketing, right? If you're talking about organic growth on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, 
So you actually have to make two choices here, right? The first is what is your growth model? And then secondarily, what channel are you going to focus on within that? And so within social media, I mean, that's social media, specifically Instagram, for example, is a channel under viral growth. By the way, viral growth doesn't just mean you get 10,000 views on your video. It means, Jared, you and I are right here. And somebody that's not, like, I tell you about something and then you tell someone else about something. And so like we spread it kind of like a, I don't know, imagine there was like this virus spreading all over the world. If you could just imagine that as like an idea, like imagine there was this virus spreading from person to person to person to person, right? Nobody's interacting with patient zero anymore. That's kind of the idea of word of mouth marketing is that you want it to spread from person to person. So it doesn't have to just happen on social media. In fact, some of the best word of mouth marketing, the hardest to track is literally a friend's meeting another friend for coffee. And they're like, hey, you got to check out Jared's podcast about buying online businesses. You know, you don't know that that's happening. You're not there, but it's happening. Viral growth is one of the five growth models. The second is paid growth. Now, paid growth can also happen on a social media platform or a billboard or a search engine, but paid growth is very simple. It's it's not, but it, it is at the same time. It's can you put in a dollar and get more than a dollar out, right? If not, yeah. you're losing in paid marketing, right? Yeah. Can you put in a dollar and get at least a dollar and a penny or a dollar and 20 cents back? But that's paid growth, right? And then you've got sticky growth. So sticky growth is actually one of the hardest to get, but it's really about creating an irreplaceable infrastructure for someone. So like QuickBooks, for example, once you start using QuickBooks in your business, you're never going to stop. You're never going to switch to another platform. And so they can invest all this money in direct sales calls, cold calling people, businesses, big billboard ads, giant brand awareness campaigns, because they know once you're in, you're in. But then the other two are you've got SEO, right? Which is kind of like word of mouth marketing, but they're robots, right? Google tells, tells you about my business. <laughs> and then you've got affiliates, right? Which is affiliates is kind of like paid, except for affiliate partners, you don't pay them unless they drive results, right? Yes. If, you know, if you have affiliate partners like growing your business, based. then when they make a sale, it's commission-based, exactly. So those are the five growth models. Pick one, hyper-focus on that, and you'll see dramatically more results than if you're sort of kind of doing a little bit of all five. And I guess the way to pick one of those growth strategies for a business would be knowing what's the best discovery phase or the best way to discover your business for your target market or your avatar or your demographic or whatever yeah. you want to call it. Would that be right? Like just finding out what is the most natural way for people to discover your business? Yeah, because our goal here is not to change how someone discovers things or does their life, right? It's to find real people mm -hmm. who have a real problem and then find out, okay, mm -hmm. how are they already trying to solve that problem? Or are there other problems in their life that they're solving a different way? You know, and, and so for example, if like, if you're trying to help someone, I mean, maybe for example, you're trying to sell a product or have a content website that's trying to help people negotiate raises at their job, right? Just as an example, and you start to identify these real people who are doing this, right? You, they have a problem, they need to get a raise. Okay, and you wanna help them negotiate mm -hmm. getting a raise. That's the problem you're gonna solve. Your solution is that you've got guides, both free and paid that you sell that helps them do this. Well, where are these people mm -hmm. who need a raise? They're browsing LinkedIn job and Craigslist job ads, but maybe exactly. Craigslist isn't a great content platform, so maybe you go on LinkedIn, but they're they're already on LinkedIn looking for a new job. Well, the, now all of a sudden you go, okay, well, great. I'm just gonna go where they already are, and that's where I'm gonna reach those people. And so that's the goal here, is to find out where, once you get clear on the real people, it's it's your empathy advantage that you're, you're wired with as a human to try to put yourself in someone else's shoes and think, okay, where are they already going to solve this problem, and how can I get there? I wanna touch on the, intent here as well because there's something mm -hmm. quite deeper that people may not understand is like if you try and convert somebody who is at a water park having fun with their kids to buy a set of knives like they're not really wanting to buy a set of knives right now especially when they're right. swimming in the pool right. with their kids but for somebody that is super hungry to like work out why their goat's sick and what are they going to do? They're going to turn to probably the biggest search engine in the world, Google, and type in some right. keywords. And their intent, like their intent is to solve a problem. And when you get in front of those people in the right place at the right time and show them that you can solve that problem with your product or service, 
it's far more <laughs> far more easier to convert sales and through marketing in your whole funnel, right? Because the intent of what they want is so high at that particular time and place. Yes. And then intent is huge. And that's, but it can be the exact same person, right? So let's go back to the example of the guy who's at a, a water park or a splash pad, you know, with his kids and, you know, you're trying to sell knives, right? Okay, well, maybe now is not the time to close the sale, but he might actually be your target customer, right? Maybe he is your target customer and you're trying to figure out, well, how do I get his attention? Well, all customers move through three phases and this is probably an oversimplification, but we, we skip the basics, right? We always get really complicated with algorithms and that kind of stuff. Let's talk about the basics for a second. Mm. Everyone in the world is either a prospect, a lead, or a customer for your business. A prospect is someone who could potentially maybe become a customer or a lead one day. Oprah Winfrey mm -hmm. is a prospect. Maybe she's not a great podcast prospect for your business unless you're selling something that she actually needs. But let's just say this guy right now is a mm. prospect and you're trying to figure out how do I get him to become a lead? Now, a lead is someone who said yes to at least one offer you've given them. That could be joining your email list or that could be following you on social media, giving you their phone number. It could be a hundred things. It's they've said yes at least once. Well, if I'm, I'm thinking right now, okay, I'm selling, let's just call it Cutco Knives. That's one of the biggest like companies in the US at least where people like you know buy knives and sell them to people. They're really sharp knives, they're cool knives. So let's just say I'm trying to figure out how do I get this guy's attention to get him to become a lead. I know he's focused on playing with his kids. What do his kids want on a hot day? Watermelon. This is just what occurred to me. I'm gonna get a watermelon and I'm gonna get really good at, gr at taking this really sharp knife and carving quickly, carving shapes into the watermelon, showing how quickly the knife cuts through it, you know, making this whole show of it to get, you know, to give the watermelon to the kids, to get the guy's attention. And he's like, what knife is that? And you're like, well, hey, actually, that, I'm glad you asked. I, lo I love these knives. These are cut code knives. You see how fast, watch this, throw that watermelon up in the air. Whoosh, I just slice through it, right? Isn't that cool? Yeah, in fact, I, you know, I'd love to, I'd actually would love to show you a little bit more about these knives since you asked. Can I get your phone number? I'll uh, reach out and schedule another time when you're not with your kids. Done. Right? I mean, like that's not <laughs> yeah. an online business in that example. That's a, but that's that's what it takes, right? That's how you're going prospect to lead. And then once they say yes, give you that phone number, that's your chance to get convert them to lead a customer. Yeah. Yeah. At a time that's more suitable to them when they're ready for mm -hmm. the information you have to give them. That's that's a great example. Now, we, we talked about like so much already, but how do we identify where these gaps are within our business. Like I noticed that mm -hmm. you you talk about quarterly, quarterly offsites and stuff like that. I do a quarterly offsite in my life and my business. But is this okay. where we would identify some of these pitfalls or some of these things that we should be doing in our business that we aren't doing or some of the things that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing in our business? Well, I actually created a free tool that's supposed to help with this. So if you go to yourthrivescore.com, you can take a free assessment that asks you questions about different areas of your business and literally gives you a numerical score. Now, so far, no one's gotten 100 out of 100, right? That's okay. The goal here is not actually to get a perfect score, it's to find out where are the gaps. So that's a tool that's supposed mm -hmm. to help. But yes, I do, like you said, I'm actually literally next week going with my wife to stay with some friends in Colorado and that's once every 90 days, my wife and I go on a quarterly offsite where we spend a couple of days. We typically track on, tack on some fun stuff too, not that the goal setting is not fun, but then we go to like a co-working <laughs> space usually yeah. and map out, okay, what are we doing with our life? What are we doing with our business? Kind of where are we at? And we that's when, what, when we set, and I set quarterly goals. So that's like my main focus for the next 90 days. So that's how I approach it. But honestly, this is a tool that's supposed to make it easier. So you don't just, you're not just looking at a whiteboard going, okay, okay, what should I do? What should I do? Well, no, go to yourthrivescore.com, take the free assessment, get your score and then improve it. Right. And when you see that score improve, your bottom line should improve as well, because these are all business fundamentals. And so, so talk to, I talk that's to us more about this resource that you have. Is that prompted by questions? Because I know that in, you know, in my quality offsite, it's not just me like sitting down and having thinking time and just seeing what comes to me. It's even when I do thinking time, sure. I have like it's prompted by questions in a certain area in my life that needs attention or in my business. So is this prompted mm -hmm. by questions, questions, this resource and like what's really involved with it? Yeah. So it's a series of multiple choice questions. And so like, for example, a question might be saying like, how well do you know your target customer? And then just being able to, to ask that and kind of answer a few, you can say either a, 
I have a clearly defined target customer, including documented details on their behavior and lifestyle. Or B, I have a general idea of who my target customer is. <laughs> C, I have several different types of target customers with very different needs. Or D, I would love a customer. Any customer will do. Right. And so the goal here is not to, <laughs> you know, the goal here is not to shame you for where you're at in the process. It's to help you because really the score is for you. It's not for me. Right. The yeah. score is for you. So you can look at this and see you know, where you're at and kind of get a pulse. By the way, if I might add this, you know, the nuance to what you're teaching, Jared, this might be worth running through with a perspective business before you buy it. Right. Like run through and ask these questions and kind of get a get a score of kind of like your thrive score of where the business is. And say like, mm -hmm. okay, the Thrive score is a 42, but if I change these three things, it goes up to a 68. Okay, actually, this seems like a really good acquisition. You know what I mean? Like, obviously there's more to an acquisition than that, but that that would be one tool in your toolbox to assess your opportunities. Yes, yeah, certainly, certainly. And I have a part of that within my community as well. It's more dedicated to the purchase oh, space, but I think, you know, this is an, an additional thing that could could certainly work. And so it's been so interesting to talk about a business in terms of like, how do we make sure it doesn't just crash and burn and actually enjoy our business, allow it to thrive? What do you see some of the ramifications of in the next five to 10 years? Like how would we be cleaning up our businesses? Because hmm. I know that a lot of people struggled last year. Some people gained from it. But yeah. like, what do we, what do you see that how we're going to have to clean up some of our businesses and clean up some of the mess that's, that's happened from this global pandemic? The great reset, which is kind of the term that a lot of economists have started using to refer to 2020, right? Mm -hmm. Cause it's more than COVID-19 it's government restrictions. It's yes. global trade yes. falling apart. It's supply chains deteriorating. Yes. It's, it's a lot of things. The great reset mm -hmm. has caused a lot of changes. And l let me just say first, there's been a lot of, there were a lot of bad and hard things that happened. It, I don't know if anyone's really been able to quantify the damage worldwide yet, but at least in the US, over 100,000 businesses permanently closed in the US in 2020. And that's, I mean, that's, you think about businesses, again, remember, these are real entrepreneurs who sacrificed date nights and weekends, and there's life savings to go out and build something to try to make the world a better and to make their life better as well. And because of a lot of factors, a lot of them that came to head last year, they ultimately had to, had to give up and walk away from that. Now, many of those people have moved on to other projects, so it's not all doom and gloom, but that's sad, that's tragic. And that's mm. honestly, all over the world, it's much worse. I mean, you think about day laborers in India being told to stay, who make $1.20 a day, being told to stay indoors under lockdown for 60 days. How are you supposed to do that? And so yeah. there's a lot of bad things that happen, mm. but in the midst of all that, kind of rising from the ashes of that, one of the biggest things that I think is exciting and interesting and is also going to be challenging to all of us as entrepreneurs and investors is that the age of information is over. Now, that's a crazy thing to say, right? I mean, you read in history books about, okay, there was the Stone Age and there was the Bronze Age. No, like you, people lived through that shift, right? I mean, there were their world just changed that's dramatically. Cool. The age of information has ended and we're moving into what the World Economic Forum calls the age of insight. And I think that's a really apt description of what we're moving into. If you think about it, 99% of your energy when it comes to information is spent ignoring it, <laughs> ignoring notifications on your phone, ignoring emails in your inbox, ignoring headlines that are, you know, in news, 10,000 advertisements a day that is, you know, is what the average person sees. So, Mm. Information was really cool 40 years ago as this idea that you can have access to all of the information in the world about anything. And then we realized, oh my goodness, I have access to all of the information in the world about everything. And that's really overwhelming. So what we've begun to do as humans is naturally adapt and say, okay, I don't actually need to know everything there is to know. Okay, let's go back to the goats example. I don't need to go through an entire course or read a textbook on yeah. why goats have an iron deficiency right? Or all the How symptoms. Do I, get I just need to know. Yeah. Yes. I just need to know the insight, which is like the filtered version of that. Like what's the two things I need to know to, fi to fix my goat. And so that's true in every industry. So if you're creating content, it's less about the 2000 word article and more about what is the insight? What is the, which is insight is information that's been distilled down to its practical application. Mm -hmm. So what's the insight that you can create in your industry for real people? And I think that's a shift that's only just begun. I think that's awesome. Age of the insight in term, like there's so many people should be listening to this and just having so many profound insights. <laughs> uh, into, <laughs> I hope so. In, yeah. 
yeah, into this because I have. I've just gone, wow, all right, this is this is really cool for how I'm gonna create media in the future. You know, I think mm-hmm. it's I think it's great. And I wanna mention your book. People are gonna wanna go away and and check it out, guys. If you haven't checked it out, make sure you do check it out. It's endorsed by uh, Thank you. Michael Hyatt, Pat Flynn, and a bunch of other awesome people. So where can people go to get this book? So if you go to surviveandthrivebook.com, of course, you'll find links there to where you can find the book on Amazon and Audible and Barnes and & Noble and Books A Million and mm-hmm. all the other wonderful bookstores of the world. But the reason why I want you to go to surviveandthrivebook.com is when you do that and you order the book, there's an option for you to enter your order number and get a $129 worth of bonuses for free. So you'll get, if you buy the paperback version, you're going to get the ebook and the audiobook version for free, but you're also going to get a companion video course that I've created called Built to Thrive. So the book is good, right? Just If you just buy the book, that's all you need. But if you want some supplementary training that goes along with that, then I've created a video course called Built to Thrive that really walks through how to apply this to your business, practically speaking. So I encourage you to do that and I look forward to hearing about what comes about when you put the book and the framework into practice in your business. Awesome. Oh, there'll be links to this in the show notes, guys, to both the resource and the book. And everybody that is listening, thank you so much for listening. Before you go, I want you to think of two to three people who either are thinking about buying a business and want to apply some of what we talked about in this podcast episode or own a business and would get a lot of value from the insights that we actually talked about in this podcast as well. And yes, of course, you'd be doing a massive favor by sharing this episode with them to help grow the show too. But thank you guys. I'll see you on the next one. Hey, YouTube watcher. If you thought that video is good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy. Or check out my playlist on how I made my first 100K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out. It's an awesome playlist. You'll enjoy it.